When I an awesome wonder Consider all the worlds thy hands have made I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder Thy power throughout the universe displayed Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee How great thou art, how great thou art Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee How great thou art Did you know that studies show that when a child is first born, those who immediately, those children, who immediately have skin-to-skin contact with their mothers thrive much better than those who are whisked away and perhaps placed in a nursery for long periods of time? Skin-to-skin contact helps those babies cry less and sleep longer and adjust to breastfeeding much more quickly. Beyond that, studies show skin-to-skin touch lowers the stress and the heart rate of both the mother and of her newborn child. Other studies have been done involving babies whose mothers, for some reason, could not touch them or did not touch them very much or at all. These little babies, by contrast to the ones who did receive a great deal of touch, seem detached, disinterested, and sometimes even seemingly depressed. They didn't smile much, if at all. So some studies were then undertaken to provide those untouched babies with, in the absence of their human mother who could not or did not provide skin-to-skin touch, provide them some human skin-to-skin contact. In these studies, Senior citizens were picked up from retirement in senior homes and driven to the hospitals where these little just-born babies were in a nursery. Older people from what's called a nursing home were coming to the nursery. Every day, an old person would take an older person, I should probably say, because I is one of them. Every day, an older person would take a baby and rock the baby back and forth in a rocking chair. And you know what happened? Well, you guessed it. The babies that seemed depressed and detached seemed to almost immediately respond. They even started to smile and coo. I'm sure you can guess the other positive consequences. Many of the seniors who were lonely themselves and feeling detached and unwanted and stuck away in some little room somewhere, unvisited for many, many months and even years by friends and relatives, they started to respond themselves because they could see that their touch was helping. Our message today is the power of touch. I'm Greg Albrecht, and this is CWR, Christianity Without the Religion, on behalf of thousands of friends and partners who live all around this world. Welcome to our audio teaching ministry, and you may be one of those friends and partners who help make this ongoing ministry possible through your prayers and through your financial support. Thank you with sincere thanksgiving and appreciation for your support. Perhaps you're new to CWR, Christianity Without the Religion, and if you are, let me come back to that in just a moment before we begin our message. But first, as we talk about touching, human touching, uh, sadly, in our world, I really need to pause for what's called a disclaimer. What's the disclaimer? Well, first of all, I've just in a minute or two, or a few minutes ago now, I have related studies that show the enormous positive influence of human touch. Secondly, we don't need to cite studies about the negative consequences of other kinds of human touching. There is, sadly, such a thing as inappropriate touching And it's a necessary part of the training that parents give to their young children once they start to grow and mature, telling them that some touching is inappropriate. 
So thirdly, let me state the obvious at the outset when we talk about the power of touch. The point of our message today is not to encourage all of us to go out and become touchy-feely people. Touching another human is a complicated and potentially dangerous action and litigious action. So we're not talking or urging everybody to go out and start touching anybody from little old baby, little babies, not little old babies, but babies and little old men and women or everybody in between. Our focus in our message, point number four, is the divine touch of Jesus, which we've simply used some human analogies, some literal analogies up front in our message today to point toward the divine touch of Jesus, which is always 100% of the time not only appropriate, but it's soothing, it's comforting, and healing. But again, if you're new to CWR, I want to welcome you. If you're just poking your head in the door, metaphorically, for the first time, pull up a chair, and as they say down south, sit a spell. You're warmly welcomed by one and all. We're on a number of radio stations, and of course, we are known uh, by people who are referred to us by their friends. And so there may be a number of reasons and a number of avenues and that have brought you to CWR, and you're welcome here. The audio teaching ministry of Christianity without the religion, CWR, is part of the body of Christ, the church, the universal body of Christ. But we don't meet in a building. These messages are not sermons originally given in a building, and then you listen to them secondhand. These sermons are exclusively prepared and taped for electronic consumption on radio stations, on our website, on CDs, and any other place electronically that a person may download us. We are, by God's grace here at CWR, part of the church. We're not all of the church, but we are, by God's grace, part of it. We're not better or worse than people who choose to do church in a building. Our services are exclusively available electronically, and it's in the name of Jesus that we have the opportunity to serve you. We're talking about spiritual touch today, and specifically the touch of Jesus. And we want to also say up front today, as I did give a disclaimer about inappropriate physical touching, I want to also say up front that we realize that many of you have been inappropriately touched spiritually by Christless religious institutions. That can be a traumatizing and debilitating experience. I assure you today that the touch we're talking about today is the healing, the comforting, and the assuring touch of Jesus. Before we begin our message by reading from the fifth chapter of the Gospel of Mark, let's pray. Our Father in heaven, thank you for already touching us by your grace. Thank you for already touching us, moving us, motivating us, embracing us, beckoning to us, inviting us to you. And now we pause to consider more of what it means to be touched by Jesus. And we pray your inspiration. May you speak not because of me, but in spite of me. May you speak through me. But most of all, may the gospel of Jesus Christ be proclaimed. Thank you. We pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Mark chapter 5, verse 21 through 29 is our keynote passage, the Gospel of Mark chapter 5. We begin reading in verse 21. And before I begin reading, we're breaking into the middle of a thought when Jesus is ministering all around the land of Palestine, and he is traveling to and fro sometimes by foot and sometimes by boat. And we pick up the story as he travels by boat in chapter 5 of Mark, verse 21. When Jesus had again crossed over by boat to the other side of the lake, a large crowd gathered around him while he was by the lake, and one of the synagogue leaders named Jairus came. And when he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet. He pleaded earnestly with him, My little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. So Jesus went with him. On the way, as Jesus was going with Jairus to heal the daughter of this ruler of the synagogue, a large crowd, continuing in verse 24 of chapter 5 now of Mark, followed and pressed around him, and a woman was there 
who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She'd suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had, yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came up from behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak, because she thought to herself, if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. Immediately, her bleeding stopped, and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. Stop and think with me for a moment. What one symbol immediately communicates who Jesus was, who he is, and who he always will be? Well, of course, I think that most of us would say that's his cross. But you know, in the first 300 years of Christianity, as I've often said in print, in our many resources at CWR and our website at www.ptm.org, ptm.org, if you're new to our ministry, or if, as often said, in these audio messages, these sermons, in the first 300 years or so of Christianity, when people wanted to convey the reality, power, and love of Jesus, they didn't think of a cross, they didn't use a cross in some symbol, our symbolic way. The cross at that time was still regarded by and large as the instrument of torture and death used within the Roman Empire to intimidate, deter, and eliminate those that it determined to be incorrigibles. For Christians in the first three centuries, the cross didn't convey hope or love. It symbolized violence, oppression, domination. So in those first centuries, what did Christians do when they wanted to symbolically convey the hope of our Lord Jesus Christ? More often than not, they used images of the hands of Jesus and of the hands of Jesus touching people and healing them. On either the physical or the spiritual level, touching is a powerful symbol and reality. Here in our keynote passage in the fifth chapter of the Gospel of Mark, we're reading about two people who valued the touch of Jesus. First of all, we read of a man named Jairus. As one of the rulers of a synagogue, Jairus had some honor and prominence in the community. But for all of his dignity, Jairus was at the end of his rope. His daughter was dying. He was powerless to help his daughter, but he had apparently heard that Jesus could heal. So Jairus laid aside all of his religious stature and importance, and he threw himself at the feet of Jesus, who was not a recognized religious authority by the religion that Jairus was a part of, and he begged Jesus to come and lay hands on his little girl. The second person Mark mentions in our keynote passage in Mark chapter 5 is an unnamed woman. We read of the name of the ruler of the synagogue, Jairus, but this woman is not named, and the Bible says she had an issue of blood. She had been subject for bleeding, to bleeding, for 12 years. Probably this was some sort of uterine, vaginal, bloody discharge. It persisted, as Mark says, for 12 years. And as he continues to say, she'd suffered a great deal. She'd consulted doctors. She spent a lot of money, but instead of getting better, the condition worsened. Like Jairus, this lady also seemed to have been of some means, some stature. She'd spent all that she had. Well, that means that she had money to spend. And most people in that culture at that time, if you read the life and teachings of Jesus, let alone histories of that particular time in the land of Palestine, where people were oppressed and dominated by the military presence of Rome, the vast majority of people would not have had any money to begin with. All this lady wanted to do, according to Mark chapter 5, was to touch Jesus. She wasn't looking for some elixir potion. She wasn't looking for him to give her some sort of incredible medical advice. She just wanted to touch him. She'd heard about Jesus and felt that even if Jesus himself didn't have time to overtly reach out and touch her, then if she could just touch him, make contact with him, and just touch his clothes, and of course his clothing was touching his skin, and that would be enough. The woman was living in a society where women were not given the same respect as men. They weren't valued like men were. And again, we're not even told her name, are we? But this woman, this woman, that's all she was, a woman, an unnamed woman, 
not even regarded as important enough to be named. Not only was she a woman, she was a sick woman, and she couldn't contribute to her home, her family, to her society. For 12 years, she'd been experiencing a constant, unremitting flow of blood. Few things, apart from being a leper, were as damaging in her religious culture as being a woman who never stopped bleeding. According to the teachings of her religion, Judaism, the Mosaic Law, her bleeding meant she was constantly contaminated, not just physically, but spiritually. Because of her contamination, no one could lay down on the same bed clothing she had lain on, or they couldn't even sit on any chair that she sat on. She was not even allowed to attend synagogue. She was regarded as someone who, with a constant flow of blood, as unclean and defiled. Now, I want to point out, when we read in our passage, we get the very definite impression that these two individuals were not wild-eyed, unsophisticated, superstitious, snake-handling, uneducated people who fell for any kind of religious idea. No, not by the standards of their culture, at least. They weren't going down to see a traveling fortune teller and buy some snake oil. They really believed that Jesus was the real thing, and touch was important to them. They wanted to make contact with Jesus. They needed him. They believed he could heal. And as the greater context of Mark chapter 5 explains, he did. When you read the Gospels and read of Jesus healing someone, you'll find it that in the majority of cases, he actually touched the person in the process of healing them. At the beginning of our message today, we talked about images and symbols of Jesus' hands and his touch that were used after his death and resurrection in the first few centuries by Christians to help them realize the significance of Jesus and what he does for us. He touches us. He heals us. He comforts us. We're close to him. We have an intimate relationship with him, not a distant relationship, but he touches us. We mentioned also that at that particular time, crucifixion was still a brutal method of torture and death, that the cross had not come to be the symbol it is for us today as Christ followers. And we should also mention that when Jesus touched people, he was swimming upstream in that religious culture. In his day, religious authorities did not touch people for a variety of reasons. If you read the Old Covenant carefully, you'll see that the priests who actually touched someone who was considered, to use the Old Covenant terminology, unclean, they were considered to be contaminated themselves. They, the priests, had to undergo ceremonial washing and a period of time needed to lapse before they could serve as a priest again. Jesus, our great high priest, the architect and the author of the new covenant, touched the unclean. He touched the untouchables. He touched lepers. And of course, no one in his culture would do such a thing for fear of becoming a leper. Ebola virus is unfortunately, again, a part of our world and has risen again to the levels of fear in many African countries. Jesus touched those with Ebola. It's hard for us to consider how shocking it was for people to see and hear Jesus touching people with such abandon as he did. The Jews, of course, had their old covenant, which had restrictions about touching. The non-Jews had images of their gods, which, of course, as icons, as pieces of stone or wood, they never touched humans. But here, Jesus, God in the flesh, did not keep his distance. He didn't have a high regard for his own personal safety or hygiene. He moved near. It didn't matter if the person was physically diseased or physically dirty or if the person was considered spiritually unclean. No one was untouchable for Jesus. No one is untouchable for Jesus right now. Not you, not me, not anyone. God in Christ came near. He became one of us and he's never left that relationship. He's still near. He's still available, still willing to touch us, still willing for us to touch him. Back to our keynote passage briefly as we begin to conclude this message today. We haven't read all of the fifth chapter of Mark, but let me just fill in the details what the famous radio personality Paul Harvey, for those of you who remember Paul Harvey, used to call 
the rest of the story. What about the woman who believed she could be healed by just touching Jesus or by just touching his clothing? Jesus said this to her in Mark chapter 5 and verse 34. We have not read that particular verse. It's a little later than our keynote passage. He said to her, Mark chapter 5, verse 34, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. And what about Jairus, whose daughter was dying, who asked Jesus to come and lay hands on her? Mark chapter 5, verse 35 through 42. While Jesus was still speaking to the woman, some people came from the house of Jairus and the synagogue leader and said, your daughter is now dead. Why bother the teacher anymore? You'd ask him before she was still alive, come, and he didn't make it in time, and now she's dead. It's hopeless. It's over. Overhearing what they had heard, Jesus said, don't be afraid. Just believe. He did not let anyone follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. And when they came to the house of the synagogue leader, Jesus saw a commotion with people crying and wailing loudly. The funeral dirges had started. He went in and said to them, why all this commotion and wailing? The child's not dead, but asleep. But they laughed at him. He put them all out because he wasn't into circus ceremonies and throwing away crutches and getting people all excited in some big arena atmosphere. He took the child's father and mother and the disciples who were with him. He went into where the child was. He took her by the hand and said, Talitha Kwam, which means, little girl, I say to you, get up. Immediately, the girl stood up and began to walk. She was about 12 years old. At this, they were completely astonished. If you or a loved one is suffering right now, you desperately want to be physically healed by Jesus. At some point in all of our lives, physically, we want him to touch us and make us physically whole. At many other times in our lives, we ask Jesus to touch someone else, a friend, a loved one whose body is broken and diseased, and restore them to health. But when it comes to physical healing, which we might call the healing physical touch of Jesus, the fact of the matter is this. All documentation and all evidence in the history of 2,000 years of Christian history shows us that it seems sometimes Jesus touches to heal and physically, absolutely, and miraculously heals, and sometimes he doesn't. We therefore conclude that while physical healing is wonderful and incredible, while the relief of suffering and anxiety is such a blessing, the New Testament accounts of how and when Jesus physically touched people are not promises. He will always do the same for you and me. Neither can we assume that they were promises or indications that he physically healed everyone in that day and age when he walked the earth, because we can read about people in the book of Acts whom the apostles, in the name of Jesus, healed but Jesus did not. And they were there in Jerusalem and its environs all the time Jesus conducted his ministry, and no doubt he may well have passed them by. What can we conclude? The primary teaching of these examples is about the spiritual healing of Jesus, which he does give always without fail for those who ask and those who trust him. If you don't believe you've ever been touched by Jesus, you can ask him, and he will. The same Jesus who healed the daughter of Jairus and who healed the woman with the 12-year-old issue of blood will reach out to you, touch you, and spiritually heal you. The touch of Jesus is life-changing. The touch of Jesus affirms and confirms that he cares. The touch of Jesus sends the clear message that he is near and that you and I are dear to him. Jesus' touch sustains us. It fills us with eternal life. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, thank you for the touch of Jesus. Thank you for being near to us so that we can touch you, Jesus, and you're not far away from us ever, and that you always are willing to be touched, even by the untouchables. In Jesus' name we pray and thank you. Amen. And thank all of you for allowing us, trusting us to minister to you here at Plain Truth Ministries, and CWR. We are delighted to do so and want to ask you to come back next week for a sermon from Matthew chapter 18, verses 10 through 13. Our sermon will be titled, These Little Ones. Until then, 
May we all seek the spiritual healing touch of Jesus, for he is near to us. Please join us on our website, www.ptm.org, for more spiritual nourishment that we provide through the many ministries and resources here at Plain Truth Ministries. My Savior, God, to